we have six exciting presentations lined up for this session. So before moving on to the presentations, let me first welcome the chair for this session, Professor Shaji Waki, former Dean, School of Social Science, University of Kerala. Professor Shaji Waki, please. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is our first uh, technical session, uh, which is titled uh, Chinese Perspectives and uh, Schemes on Regional Engagements. Engagement, and uh, we have, uh, as uh, uh, already told, we have six presentations uh, coming up. Uh, before making, um, uh, before leaving the, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, allowing them to present the uh, uh, papers. Uh, let me make a couple of, uh, you know, comments. Um, because uh, I have seen that uh, uh, most of the presentations are related to um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. So let me make you a few um, uh, you know, references about uh, the issue. So at the outset, uh, what I propose to say is that this conference is on uh, China's rise, definitely it is a, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the most important uh, uh, issue that face the world today. Uh, or uh, when it comes to South Asia and it comes to India, we to have uh, much more to concern about this um, uh, issue of the rise of China, as already pointed out by Professor Kondapal. But I am neither um, a, a China passer nor a, a, an unapologetic, uh, you know, uh, you know, a person who, uh, without any qualifications, support the, the policies being followed by China. So. Um, so in that way, uh, my my comments have to be taken. Uh, uh, this is my uh, by my appeal to you. Uh, so the the uh, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, has been highlighted as uh, the centerpiece of Xi Jinping's foreign policy, um, as has already uh, you know described. It is the project of the uh, century. Uh, it has been described as the Marshall Plan uh, of uh, uh, the new era. Um, and uh, it, it eminently suits, fits to the, uh, the rising power status of China. And as we know, it is the largest infrastructure investment project. Uh, it covers, as uh, already told by Professor Gondapurli, uh, more than 130 countries. Um, it is uh, more than 65% of the global population it covers, and uh, more than 40% of the global GDP also uh, that it hopes to, uh, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, uh, covers uh, under the BRI project. So it's a, uh, you know, the China also proposes to spend a massive sum of uh, uh, money on the BRI project. Uh, it is estimated by, that by 2027, uh, 1.2 to 1.3 trillion dollars is going to be spent on uh, the BRI. Politically also this, uh, this is very significant because uh, uh, it's, it's considered as a, a pushback against the US uh, pivot to Asia and uh, uh, quad projects. Um, and it's also aims at breaking the bottleneck in uh, in Asian connectivity. Um, uh, officially, uh, it is the BRI is uh, uh, described as uh, is uh, or BRI promotes uh, global multipolarity. It promotes uh, economic globalization. It promotes cultural diversity. And uh, um, uh, the BRI upholds global um, free trade regime and open world uh, economy in the spirit of, uh, uh, let us say, open 
uh, regional competition. So what uh, BRI is all about is also very significant. Um, uh, Xi Jinping actually described uh, BRI as China's, uh, uh, the two wings of China's great eagle. Um, and uh, another prominent Chinese uh, politician, Yang Jiechi, uh, he, he said that uh, uh, this is to build a, a, a sort of a garden for all, um, uh, not a backyard uh, for its own um, uh, you know, Chinese people. So uh, overall, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the idea uh, on the part of China is to, start, uh, to, to, to reassert the fact that uh, BRI would bring about uh, an equitable development, progress and peace uh, among all countries in the world. And it's also, it was made part of the PRC constitution also. There is a lot of, of uh, propaganda and talk in, uh, it is awash with uh, the, B, the BR, the, the, the very idea is uh, very much present since, particularly since 2015 in, in China. And from the, uh, the regionalist point of view also, um, uh, this has been uh, described by a scholar Ling Wei as, uh, as, as, Developmental regionalism, which focuses on development, fo uh, it focuses on development, it focuses on pragmatism, flexibility, and and also developmental security. And it's a, it's a, it's considered as a a non-Western vision of uh, regionalism, where regionalism is understood uh, more as uh, in a functional manner than 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 territorial. So, I, so here I want to make a critique of BRI. As I said uh, at the at the outset, um, I'm not a uh, you know uh, you know uh, uncritically I don't uh, accept the the idea of BRI. Uh, economically speaking, it is a uh, it is a, it's a reflection of China's uh, uh, crisis of power accumulation. It's a, from a Marxist perspective, it's a crisis of over accumulation uh, of capital for China. And this uh, over accumulation of capital happens in, uh, uh, it's a rather we would say that it's a combination of three things that contribute to this uh, over accumulation of capital. One is the uh, uh, over accumulation, it, it's uh, the accumulation of sur surplus capital uh, looking for investment uh, it is uh, uh, it's uh, it's the surplus commodities uh, looking for buyers and uh, surplus labor uh, looking for uh, productive uh, employment and uh, this over accumulation crisis as david Har uh, harvey rightly said uh, you know leads to special fixes also uh, such special fixes has happened in the past also uh, in the 19th century, uh, UK, uh, Britain had, uh, uh, you know, uh, employed this uh, idea uh, by exporting um, capital, commodities, labor, etc., to US, Australia, Argentina, South Africa. And in the 1960s, uh, uh, you know, Japan had employed it. In the 1970s, Korea had done it. In the 1980s, uh, Taiwan had done it. Uh, and a part of the money had uh, gone to China, which uh, contributed to the economic growth, uh, which happened in uh, China uh, later on. So um, I think this is also very significant. Uh, this partly, or uh, in a sense, that you know, that explains the this uh, BRI, the whole BRI initiative. And uh, statistics also proves that uh, China experienced excess capacity problems in the 21st century, particularly in, uh, in areas like steel, cement, glass, aluminium, coal, shipbuilding, solar and wind energy, etc., etc. In all these areas, um, uh, excess capacity problems, if such excess capacity problems happen within a country, so therefore there is the, the only problem is to, to 
uh, to break out of uh, the geographical boundaries and to to extend to other parts of the world and uh, the second problem is also the declining capital return rates which also is uh, worth mentioning because in the 1980s uh, the capital return rate for china was only 0.22% and uh, in the 1990s it uh, uh, you know exhibited ups and downs uh, but by 19 uh, 2013 the, the the capital return rate has really uh, declined uh, from its earlier position to uh, 0.14 so there is a great capital glut which is happening in in china so actually uh, for the pri initiative is actually is is can be looked at or it has to be looked at from um uh, from this uh, capital accumulation perspective and uh, i don't uh, even believe that uh, you know uh, you know such uh, you know uh, you know uh, regional uh you know uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know building of regional economic hubs um uh, along the bri path silk road new silk road parts would automatically result in economic growth but it you know results uh, show otherwise there are uh, you know reversals which is happening so in the long run there could be trouble with the bri and uh, china probably could face reversals uh, in in terms of its implementation in the future so these are my uh, my my initial comments and uh, uh, i have uh, i think i have taken 10 minutes and uh, uh, we have now um, 1 hour and uh, 20 minutes i think uh, uh, each uh, you know participant will get uh, 10 minutes uh, 9 plus 1 means uh, uh, please uh, complete your presence uh, you know presentation in uh, 10 minutes uh, at at ninth minute i will remind you about it and uh, you have to necessarily stop at at uh, at the 10th minute because you know we as josukuti has uh, you know already told me we cannot Uh, in any way we cannot uh, extend the uh, session beyond 12 o'clock so that is the deadline before us so uh, each person no matter uh, how lengthy is uh, their paper is uh, are asked they are requested to uh, uh, present their papers within uh, the 10 minutes so that we will get little bit of time for uh, for uh, for q a uh, at the end of the session So with these few words, I I request uh, Professor uh, Quinn Bin Wang, University of Fujian PRC, for his uh, for the presentation of his paper. Uh, his paper is chi- uh, titled "The Chinese Perspectives on Regional Engagements." Uh, Professor Quinn Bin Wang. Okay, uh, hold on, please. How can I share my screen? Uh, I don't know how to use that. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, just invitation. Uh, because uh, I I don't know how to share my screen uh, with you. Uh, Hello, to... Professor uh, Chiubin. Yeah, sir, are you using Google Meet? Google Meet. Are you using Google Meet? Google Meet. Yeah, I I use Google Meet, but sir, because this is first time for me to use uh, yes. this. Bon, usually I use. Sir, I will help you, sir. Uh, at the matter. bottom of the page, can you see a, um, a a logo, and with an arrow mark inside it? Which logo? Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I I just skip it now. because I have only ten minutes. Okay, okay so uh, skip it. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, it's my pleasure to be here to attend uh, this great event. Well, uh, today I would like to share my views on Chinese uh, perspectives on regional engagements. Well, uh, first, first, firstly, uh, I would like to talk about what is China. It means uh, we should define uh, define uh, China's national identity. I think uh, national identity will determine uh, any country's like foreign uh, policy, foreign behavior, uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, is uh, diplomatic uh, perspectives. Well, uh, China is a developing country uh, because of its per capita GDP is still below the world average level. And uh, China always emphasizes that it belongs to the developing world. Uh, this is the first point uh, based on economic dimension. As for a political dimension, China is a socialism country. Uh, as we know, uh, socialism uh, system, it believes, it always put uh, people, uh, it believes that people, the people are the masters of the country. And uh, actually, uh, China always uh, believe the approach of development is people-centered. So from China's perspective, without development, so-called human rights or democracies are totally uh, idle talk. So this is based on political dimension. As for culture dimension, China believes it is a civilized country. Well, as we know, in history, the West countries uh, plundered and exploited the rest of the world savage, uh, savagely. And uh, actually, in the tribute system in history, China ever provided substantial benefits to its neighbor uh, countries. Well, as for material uh, dimension, because of China's population size, and the economy strength. So China is a super large country. Well, uh, as for international uh, dimension, China is a global power. Well, uh, China has emerged as a truly global actor impacting every region and every major issue area. Well, as a global actor, China has formulated the, the, the overall uh, diplomatic strategy. Uh, in Chinese, we call it Quan Fang Wei Wai Jiao. It includes uh, big countries as the key, neighboring countries as uh, as primary importance, and the developing countries as the foundation foundation of China's diplomacy, and the multilateral diplomacy as an important platform. Under this framework, uh, China engages in different regions in the world. Well, secondly, I would like to talk about the principles of China's regional engagements. Uh, it covers at least the three points, I, uh, in my opinion. First of all, uh, mutual respect and non-intervention. Uh, I think uh, this is based on uh, the five principles of peaceful coexistence. This is China's diplomatic tradition, as we know. And the second point is mutual benefit and win-win. China always uh, advocates to uphold the right approach to justice and interests in its diplomatic work. China claims that more consideration should be given to accommodating the interests of North neighboring and the developing countries who have long been China's friends. In other words, China would like to lose more and its friends can win more uh, for China. It doesn't matter. And the third point is uh, openness and inclusiveness. China has uh, has clarified that has uh, clarified that uh, it reject it rejects the zero uh, sum game and actions driven by a narrow pursuit of profit and reject block politics and ide ideological confrontations, uh, such as like a new Cold War. Uh, and the ultimate goal is to realize win-win cooperation and common development with the war. Uh, based on these principles, uh, China set up the sequences of its regional engagements. Actually, in the official documents, China never clarify the sequence, uh, sequences of its regional engagement, so, but we still need, uh, we still can find uh, its sequences by uh, China's diplomatic uh, behaviors and the policies. 
Well, actually, uh, with China's rising, China's presence and interest are now felt in every corner of the world. China always emphasizes that it belongs to the developing world, and the developing countries are the basis of China's diplomacy. It doesn't mean big countries are not important to China. Actually, after China's reform and opening in 1978, China paid more attention to the developed countries in order to obtain capital and technology. But now, as we know, the West views China as principal, strategic, uh, com competitive, and six for uh, US-China decoupling. As we know, China finds it's more and more difficult to deal with the West. Well, China gives uh, its high a priority to the developing countries in Asia, Africa, and the developing countries participating in One Belt, One Road uh, uh, initiative. Well, based on tradition, interest, and the geography, China set up uh, the sequences of its regional engagement. I believe both ASEAN and Africa are China's priority of top pri priority of regional engagement. And the locating in the first level, well, I will show two points of 30, uh, 35, Africa as China's top priority. First of all, firstly, China's diplomatic uh, tradition of foreign min ministers visiting China, uh, uh, visiting Africa first in the new year indicates that Africa is always a priority in China's diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy. The tradition uh, has been kept since 1990. African countries obtained China's foreign aid accounts for almost half of uh, the total China's foreign aid during the period from uh, 2013 to 2018. Well, the second level uh, is neighboring region because uh, this area is related with China's security directly. China needs a stable uh, neighboring environment to support uh, domestic uh, development. And then the third level is the other o o o OBOR partners, because OBOR initiative is China's strategic crux in these years and in future. And then the fourth level is the rest regions. Uh, well, uh, these sequences, uh, I think uh, uh, this is my personal point. Well, uh, the fourth point I would like to talk about the world's perceptions on China's regional engagements. Actually, there is a serious spirit, uh, split in, 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 in this uh, view. The West countries are concerned about China's debt trap diplomacy, uh, geo ambi uh, ambition, and that China would like to set up like a hege hegemony. They are concerned about China's uh, regional engagements. However, the developing countries, they welcome China's engagement. So, Sir Wang, you have only one minute left. Okay, Sorry. no problem. Well, uh, so they, they, they welcome uh, China's engagement and the cooperation. Well, let me conclude my uh, presentation. China's rise lies in self-reliance and hard work, but no coercion and exploitation. Same point. China's regional engagement policy is determined by its national identity and its diplomatic principles. Thirdly, China engages the regions uh, around the world. ASEAN and Africa are the top priority. The world should try to adapt to China's rise and learn to live with a stronger China. China also should consider how to reassure the West about China's rise. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wong. You, you, you are strict, strictly adhered to the, the, the time limit. Thank you for that. And now the second presentation by Professor Roger C. Liu. And uh, he will be talking about Dance with Dragon, how has relocation of supply chain accelerated BRI in Southeast Asia under COVID-19 and he's from Flame University.
Pune. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? I hope everything yes, is yes, good yes, because yes, uh, yes. I'm not currently I'm in Taiwan now. Uh, so we have some time lag here, but um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as my special thank goes to uh, Professor. If we have any uh, PowerPoint Yusuf presentation, let us know. You invitation. can you can go go on presentation. I I I I don't I don't have any slides, so I'm going to go the Indian way. Um, so. I am Roger Liu. Um, I'm currently um, an associate professor at Flame University, which is a private institution in Pune. Um, this is my sixth year in India. I've been working in India for six consecutive years. Um, I So far, I enjoy the academic uh, atmosphere in this great country. So um, I, I'm also happy to see you. Uh, with some of our old friends and colleagues here online. So uh, first, maybe I should make a disclaimer that um, um, I am not representing anyone or any country, right? So I'm here presenting as a researcher of um, geopolitics and geoeconomics, which is the two of the um, my areas of interest and the course that I'm teaching at Flame University. So uh, in this um, research or this presentation that I, li that I would like to share with you today is that I would like to clarify uh, some of the points uh, regarding BRI and their relationship between uh, BRI, RCEP, and the relocation of the global value chain or supply chain. So um, the original idea comes from this. Well, I've been studying PR, BRI since its launch in 2013. And um, after that, I, I have found that uh, if you ask scholars from you know, different countries with different backgrounds, especially the Chinese scholars versus the Western scholars or Indian scholars, um, you will have different answers regarding the BRI, the substance of BRI, the um, ontology on BRI. What actually is BRI? For the Chinese scholars, this is a beneficial project that everybody will benefit from that. And from the Western scholars, it's like um, a very ambitious geopolitical projects launched by China, well, serving China's interest in the long run and in the short run. Uh, I think um, the truth falls in between. And we have to view this in a more, you know, subjective, I mean, objective way so that we will have better evaluation of what's happening. Uh, I'm trained as an empiricist, so empiricism is something that I always believe in. So um, what's happening to BRI, especially for the past two years when we are having COVID-19? Is BRI shrinking, or especially in the area of Southeast Asia, uh, continental South Asia, ASEAN countries, or the BRI as well as other economic statecraft of China has been expanding? Uh, I think the answer for me is the latter. Um, China actually has been expanding using uh, COVID-19 as an opportunity for the past few two years, especially to expand either BRI or um, to um, further relocate the supply chain from China to East Southeast Asian countries after our, uh, the signing of RCEP. And these three things should be viewed together as part of the trinities. So I think the general idea that I want to convey here in this presentation is that when we are looking at BRI, we should not view this as a single um, isolated elements or to quote unquote demonize it too much, but we have to view it in a more objective way and consider this as a general plan, the grand plan of the economic statecraft that China has been launching. So um, what I'm going to talk about here is that we have to uh, pay attention to uh, the, the, the general uh, background that has been happening for the past few years before um, the rise of COVID-19. Um, we will see, first thing that um, we have seen is that 
generally, Southeast Asia's are more prone or getting closer to China as uh, economically. Economically, uh, especially after the launch of BRI um, in two thousand. Uh, 13 and 2015. Uh, the idea of BRI was announced by Xi Jinping, uh, respectively, in Kazakhstan and in Indonesia in 2013. So in Kazakhstan, he launched, um, he, he announced the idea of the, the belt, the Silk Road economic belt, which is the land route. And in Indonesia, he announced the Maritime Silk Road. Both things happened in 2013. Uh, but not until 2015 that the government agencies and department or ministries of China has um, drafted, uh, finished the draft of uh, more clear guidelines of what they are going to do. Until then, uh, the BR has been launched since 2015. And we can see that there is a coincidence that it is during that time, around the time that the ASEAN countries started to lean towards China economically more. Um, one of uh, the examples that people like to use or what, um, what I have observed is Singapore. Singapore can be viewed as a bellwether um, for ASEAN countries if we try to uh, evaluate or to measure the attitude of ASEAN countries towards China. Singapore can be an ind a very important indicator. So uh, since around the time they try to, um, they have um, decided to um, getting closer to China economically and participate actively in um, the BRI. So one of the big projects has been launched by Singapore and uh, China started in 2018. It's called China Singapore or Chongqing Demonstration Initiative on Strategic Connectivity. So this actually is a mixed module of transportation and connection um, that goes through, uh, that connects Singapore and Chongqing city, which is a, a municipality, the provincial level administrative area in China, uh, in the Southwest. So the thing is like that, where Singapore connects the mainland China through South China Sea and through Guangxi province, um, everything like, um, uh, the commodities will go through the land routes or the railways and reach Chongqing city, which is now becomes a manufacturing center in China. So um, Singaporeans have been very active uh, participating in that. The second thing that we can see is that uh, recently the launch of China Laos Railway, which I will elaborate later, right? So um, the reason why BRI has been um, kind of welcomed by most of the uh, Southeast Asian countries can be explained um, by economic background and reasons, okay? So the economic background here is that we can see um, from 2012, the investment of China to uh, ASEAN countries has been rising. So I have some statistics around here. Um, we, we will see that, especially for the last year, um, from, from 2019 to 2020, the proportion of the Chinese investment in ASEAN countries rise a lot. Okay, so um, in 2019, this is from, uh, this is the statistic that taken from the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, in 2019, China and Hong, China is uh, number six uh, as uh, the ranking of investors in, in ASEAN countries. And Hong Kong, China is number four. But in 2020, Hong Kong, China becomes number three and China becomes number five. So there is one uh, rise of one position for one year. That's around the rise of- Sir, so, uh, Liu, you have uh, one more minute to go. Okay. And then, so this is the background of that. And we, we can see that um, for the top uh, multinational enterprises investing in ASEAN countries, China accounts for six, 65 of them, 65 of them. And among them, 46 are 
state-owned enterprises. So it's controlled by the government. Okay. And um, I will say that BRI or um, the Chinese statecraft has demonstrated a very um, flexible manner. Uh, for the countries, they, they don't have uh, political uh, obstacles. They will remain uh, daily business. But for countries, they have some political objections. For example, Vietnam, they will try to invest in some less controversial projects like the Hanoi City Railways. And for some countries, there are some economic challenges like Laos. Well, China focus, especially on infrastructure like the uh, China Lao Railway. So uh, for the BRI, there is a flexible attitude being demonstrated here. Um, the last uh, point that I would like to summarize and make is that, well, China has made best opportunities to use the COVID-19, the rise of COVID-19, to lay out its strategic uh, distributions or plans um, geopolitically and ge ge uh, economically through BRI. And with the promotion of RCEP, actually China has been cleverly put all three things together to make them benefiting with each other. So I think this is a very important lesson for India to learn that it, when we uh, try to approach ASEAN countries, we should focus on a more comprehensive project or plan rather than focus on you know, individual projects. Thank you, I think I will stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Roger C. Liu for, for your presentation now. Um, the third uh, presentation is by Professor Kuo Wenle. He is assistant professor uh, in Shandong University, China. His uh, title is China's Rise as a Global Power through the BRI. Okay, thank you, Chair. Before starting, please allow me to share the screen. Only there is an arrow mark at the end of the screen, so you can, uh, uh, which shows present now. So you can go to that and uh, then present if you have a PowerPoint. Okay, okay. There is an arrow mark at the bottom of your monitor, and you press and then you go for sharing the screen. Okay, I will. There are three buttons, you know, have you seen three buttons on the right hand side? Three buttons, three yeah. dots. In entire screen. Yeah, you, you press first, you click on the three, three uh, uh, dots, the, the last button. Okay, last. Um, if you are not able it to do it, then uh, you do it manually. No, that says you must grant permissions. Okay. Sorry, it's okay. I can, I can go directly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good morning, everyone. And uh, today my topic is uh, China's rise as a global power through the Belt and Road Initiative. Before starting. I would like to thank Professor Joseph Kuti for inviting me to join the excellent uh, seminar and conference. And uh, regarding my topic, there are four parts. Uh, the first part is uh, background about uh, BRI. Second part, I want to talk about progress and the contribution of BRI to China's desire to be a great power. The third part is the risks and the challenges facing the BRI. And the last part is my conclusion. Now, 
Plus. Uh, could you please switch on the video, uh, uh, Wenli? Could you please switch on the video? Turn off. Oh, yes. it seems, it seems like Professor Wenli, it okay. was already on. Yes. 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 Now it is on, sir. Yes. All okay, right, sir. You can continue. Okay. So first, I would like to tell some background about BRI. We all know that uh, the BRI was proposed by the Chinese president in 2013 when he visited to, to the Central Asian and the Southeast Asian countries. And the, the BRI upholds the principles of extensive construction, joint con contribution, and the shared benefit. And it also focuses on the five areas. The first is policy coordination. Second, connectivity of infrastructure. Third is unimpeded trade. Fourth, financial integration. And the last, closer people to people ties. And we also know that there are six major corridors under the BRI. That means New Eurasian Led Bridge, China Mongolia Russian Corridor, China Central Asia West Asia Corridor, China Indo China Peninsula Corridor, and the left two corridors are CPEC and the BCI. So in in the last several years, Chinese professors or Chinese scholars, they have identified, identified 65 countries along the Belt and the Road Initiative. I'm sorry I can't present the picture, but the 65 countries are from Asia and Europe and Af African countries. And there are two countries from East Asia. 11 countries from Southeast Asia, and eight countries from South Asia, five countries in Central Asia, and 19 and 20 countries from West Asia and North Africa, and Central and Eastern Europe. So the next part is the progress and the contributions of BRI to China's great power design. I have divided four small aspects in this part. The first part is about economic aspects. So what China can benefit from the BRI? It's clearly the most important is about economic, for like the trade and the investment. And also we have some uh, seven free trade agreement with 13 countries along the BRI. And also China has set up uh, financial mechanisms like AIIB and the Secret Fund. So in the last several years, there are some major project, projects carried out going on well, like uh, Guadal Port, Hambantota Ham Port, and also China Europe Railway Express, China Lord Railways. So I have made the two uh, uh, tables and the charts. It shows that China's export value and the import value to the countries along BRI has increasing steadily. So the, in the political aspect, uh, we have set up uh, the top level mechanism like a leading group for promoting the BRI. And we also have published some very important policy document in 2015 and 2017 and also 2019. <clears throat> As of 2021, China has signed more than 200 cooperation documents for jointly building the BRI with 145 countries and 32 international organizations. And the BRI also, through BRI, China also has set up some 
international cooperation platform like uh, Bison Road Forum for International Cooperation, which has organized in 2017 and 2019, and also China International Import Ex Expo and other platforms. And the third small part is about security aspect. And with expansion of China overseas interest, China has increased its military presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Just like uh, China has carried out a large-scale military or naval modernization in the Western Pacific, China has more had been more and more active in the territorial disputes with its neighbors in the Indian Ocean region, and China has speed up anti-piracy operations and has set up first overseas military base in Djibouti. E. And China also increased its armed trade to the countries uh, along the BRI, like Pakistan, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. And also we started and expanded the security cooperation with the countries along the BRI. And more and more scholars are talking about China should expand maritime cooperation with ASEAN countries and African countries. And the most important and the hot news is in the international arena and many countries they believe or they suspect whether China will build more and more military bases. And they are thinking about China is transforming some parts into military ones. And for the, for the last small part, is the Chinese wisdom and approaches to the globe. And my idea is, Econo uh, economic benefits or political influence and security cooperation, they are one important aspect. And uh, the most important for China to be a great power is that China should, great, should con contribute to something, to the globe. So in the last several years, China has contributed its wisdom and approaches to the globe. They are giving, China is giving some ideas, some values, and some solutions to the globe, just like China is, is having active role in the global governance. And China has always been speaking about global community of shared future. And we're also talking about new type of great power relations. I think these soft things can also contribute to China's great power. And the next part is China's BRI also face some risks and the challenges. The first is from the China's Chinese domestic Professor, you have uh, one more minute. Okay, thank you, sir. And from China's domestic is about China's slowdown economy and whether Chinese leadership has continuous attention or whether leadership change will continue to support BRI. And another challenge is global COVID-19. And the next uh, risk is strategic competition among major powers like China with the US, Russia, India, and, uh, uh, and uh, Japan. And for the concurrent part, I would like to say the Belt and Road Initiative demonstrates China's ambition to grow from a regional power to global superpower. The last eight years have witnessed a rapid increase in China's influence in regional and global affairs. However, given a series of major risks and challenges, it's still unknown whether the BRI will ultimately help China become a global superpower. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, um, Professor Wenle. Now I uh, request uh, Ms. Rini Rachel uh, Abraham 
Um, she is from SN College, uh, Kerala, India. Uh, her title paper, uh, title of the paper is Rising China and uh, BRI. How the CPEC figures in the grand strategy of China. Rainy Rachel Abraham. Thank you, Shaji Vaghi, sir. Rini, you can start with the presentation. Yes, yes. I'm just yeah. uh, presenting the slides. Oh, okay. Just a second. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Respected Chair, Professor Shaji Vaghi, sir, fellow panelists, and dear participants. The title of my topic is Rising China and BRI, How CPEC Figures in the Grand Strategy of China. Before proceeding further, let me thank Professor Josuti sir and all the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Let me quickly take you through what we seek to discuss today. My paper talks about China's Belt and Road Initiative, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, how CPEC benefits China as well as Pakistan, the concerns surrounding the project, the protests going on on the ground, and whether China can continue its rise by taking recipient countries like Pakistan for granted, or whether it should find a more comprehensive way by taking host countries into confidence so as to sustain its rise. Let me start by giving a brief introduction of, of uh, the China's Belt and Road Initiative and the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. China launched its Belt and Road Initiative in 2013 as a massive global connectivity and infrastructure project. It includes land and sea corridors extending from China to Europe through Central Asia, West Asia, and Africa. It is believed to be one of the largest infrastructure projects ever initiated by a single nation on a global scale. It involves two main components, the Silk Road Economic Belt, which includes the land corridors and the 21st century maritime Silk Road, which seeks to expand China's presence across major sea lanes of communication. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is one of the six economic corridors under the BRI. It is regarded as a flagship project under it, and it began with an initial outlay of $46 billion. It is an approximately 3,000-kilometer land corridor stretching from Kashgar in western China and ending at the Gwadar port in Pakistan. Now let us see how CPEC benefits China. A major benefit for China will be that it will reduce its sea route for trade from approximately 12,000 kilometers to around 2,000 kilometers. As you all know, around 80% of China's oil imports are through the Indian Ocean and the Malacca Strait, and also about 95% of China's trade with Europe, West, West Asia, and Africa passes through the Indian Ocean. With Beijing becoming increasingly concerned about U.S. trying to contain its rise by choking its supply routes, CPEC provides Beijing with an alternative route through Guada. Guada also has the potential to emerge as a major trade hub for enhancing China's trade relations with the Gulf nations, Africa, and beyond. CPEC would also provide China with a connection with Europe through West Asia and thereby establish links with a larger market. China also seeks to develop its hitherto underdeveloped western region of Xinjiang and bring it on par with its eastern provinces. Now, how does CPEC benefit Pakistan? It is proposed to bring about huge infrastructural and industrial development within Pakistan. Better rail and road connectivity seeks to increase trade within Pakistan as well as give a boost to its exports. It is expected to develop commercial towns, industrial parks, and economic zones along the corridor, which could provide Pakistan's labor market with huge opportunities and also help develop remote regions of Balochistan, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. It would also help enhance bilateral trade relations between China and Pakistan as the CPEC would considerably decrease the transportation cost and travel time. However, in spite of the development advantages that the CPEC is bound to bring about, massive protests have been going on within Pakistan. Protests have been particularly aimed against Chinese expansionism in the region, particularly in Gwadar. 
nationalist and separatist forces in Balochistan and Sindh provinces have stepped up their activities against the project, which they see as collusion between the Pakistan army and China to plunder their natural resources. This in turn has resulted in security being beefed up in the region with the installation of several security check posts, which has further alienated the locals which, uh, since they perceive this as their rights being infringed upon, their mobility being restricted, and they being made to feel like strangers in their own land. Protests have also mushroomed against the loss of livelihoods because of the Pakistan government issuing licenses to Chinese trawlers to fish along the Makran coast. The local fishermen have been protesting against this as they find themselves in an asymmetric competition with the, China, with the Chinese, whose trawlers are equipped with state-of-the-art technology. People are also protesting against the promised job opportunities not being met. Reports indicate that CPEC has failed to meet the promise of an estimated 1.5 million jobs per year, which was promised in the original plan. CPEC construction itself has brought little economic value to Pakistan as per reports. It has been mostly built by Chinese labor, equipment and materials. There are also concerns about Pakistan falling into severe debt trap with the CPEC project. Concerns about the terms and conditions of China's development finance have been rising, with many countries renegotiating the terms of agreement under the BRI with China. Now let us go through the concerns surrounding the BRI project in general. There is a section which views a BRI with much suspicion and skepticism. They firmly believe that China is pursuing deliberate debt trap diplomacy so as to advance its hegemonic ambitions in the region. They argue that the terms and conditions of China's development finance are heavily skewed in its favor. They substantiate the argument by citing evidences such as the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka, which Sri Lanka was forced to lease out to China along with more than 6,000 hectares of land around it. They also cite similar experiences of other countries such as Laos, Myanmar, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, among others. Those wary of the BRI project point to these evidences which substantiate the fact that China uses such debt traps to procure strategic areas and translate such debts into political influence. Concerns are also there about projects under BRI not necessarily being in the host country's interests. Rather, they argue that the host country serves as mere outlets for China's excess capacity, mainly in construction and manufacturing industries, which result in the creation of many white elephant projects in the host country. There is also concern about China using its own workforce for implementing on-the-ground projects and thereby depriving local population of potential jobs. Environmentalists are also concerned about the possibility of China using BRI for exporting its carbon emissions. They are concerned about projects under the BRI being implemented without any regard to environmental laws and also with regard to many projects being carbon intensive. However, there is another section which sees the concerns raised by skeptics as exaggerated reactions against Chinese investments. They consider the BRI as China's response to the West's reaction to contain its rapid rise. They agree that BRI is not entirely an economic initiative, but that which is designed to provide backdoors to China to continue its trade and imports. All of the six economic corridors across land and sea, they argue, are designed to provide China with an alternative route, as China has fears of Strait of Malacca through which its major supply routes pass, could be used as a choking point. They also find that the debt entrapment danger of the BRI has been overplayed to a great extent. They cite in, in researches such as done by Deborah de Brottingham, who say that fears of China deliberately preying on host countries are unfounded. Also, many see the fiscal mismanagement of the host country as reason behind such countries falling into debt traps. For instance, an internal report in Pakistan by the Institute of Policy Reforms actually blamed the Pakistan government for pushing the country into debt trap by failing to bring in reforms and also ensure effective fiscal management. They also argue that financial viability of the projects depends on how deals have been negotiated and structured. They go on to say that the Chinese investments are designed to be as scrupulous and economically viable as are the recipient governments. That is, when local politicians are careful and institutions strong, Chinese investments could be uniquely valuable. You have uh, one more minute to go. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. They cite the example of the Piraeus port in Greece, which the Chinese shipping conglomerate Costco turned into Mediterranean's second largest, despite being only one of two bidders to take control in 2016. But when implementation goes poorly, it does go really poorly. 
For instance, the state-owned China Communications Construction Company was debarred by the World Bank for bribery and the Chinese officials were involved in the Malaysia's development Burhat scandal. However, the protests within Pakistan and other regions cannot be brushed aside. China needs to acknowledge the fact that it has to change the way in which such projects are implemented at the grassroots level. Both China and Pakistan should address the problems raised by local people so as to ensure that CPEC BRI meets their stated purpose and objectives. China's BRI has the potential to be one of the answers to the emerging world's infrastructure needs, but it must change the way in which in the initiative is implemented by making it more transparent, embracing local stakeholders, giving more opportunities to local people, enhan enhancing sourcing from local enterprises, engaging with labor unions and environmentalists, and also helping develop human capital. Then only can initiatives such as CPEC meet their stated goals if, since, if the local people are taken into confidence and issues addressed. This would enable China to keep up its rising momentum. Thank you. Thank you, Rini. Um, now, the next uh, presentation is by uh, Mr. Ajmal Farhan from Pondicherry University. Uh, his title of his paper is Enhancing Maritime Domain Awareness, a Chinese uh, Maritime... Uh, that's it, Enhancing Maritime uh, Domain Awareness. Sorry, that is... Okay, please, uh, Ajmal Farhan, please start. If uh, is uh, Ajmal Farhan available? If he is not uh, uh, available, now I uh, then I call. Uh, Sir, Ajmal is available. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Ajmal, uh, I think your uh, laptop is on mute. Kindly unmute yourself. Am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible now, oh, so okay. you can continue. Yes. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, respected chair and other panelists. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Joseph Kuti, sir, and uh, Department of Political Science, University of Kerala, well, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my presentation would be on the topic uh, enhancing maritime domain awareness, uh, global, a strategy, global, global, a strategy global. of becoming maritime power. So, uh, the paper intends to analyze uh, how China is enhancing its maritime domain awareness and the advantages uh, that China getting uh, China uh, going to gain by augmenting maritime domain awareness. So, as we all know, it is the biggest dream of China uh, to become a global power. Uh, it, it believes that uh, dominating maritime domain as the best possible way to achieve its dream. In 2012, uh, during its 18th party congress, uh, China has emphasized on becoming uh, a maritime uh, power ambition as a necessity for its national development, uh, for the people's well-being, uh, and for safeguarding its sovereignty and for the revival of China, which consider considers itself as a maritime power and uh, continental power in the history. In, uh, in uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, said that if China wants to achieve the great rejuvenation of nation, it must become a maritime great power. So by maritime power, it not only means uh, developing naval power, but also a large and effective coast guard, uh, a world-class merchant marine and fishing fleet, a globally recognized shipbuilding capacity and an ability to exploit economically important marine resources and protect its mar maritime rights and interests in near seas and distances as well, and ultimately the global maritime governance. Uh, in order to achieve these goals, it is very important for China to know or gather information about what is happening in the sea and what is there in it. So uh, that is uh, what comprehensive MTA means. So now before uh, explaining Chinese strategies of enhancing maritime domain awareness, let me explain what is maritime domain awareness, or MDA. It can be simply defined as uh, that uh, the knowledge about whatever happening in the sea and whatever related to it or whatever uh, there in it. Uh, according to International Maritime Organization, 
uh, MDA is the effective understanding of any activity associated with the maritime environment uh, that could impact upon the security, safety, economy, or environment. So MDA is not just a mere concept of tracking ships and movement in the sea. It also helps to gather information about the marine natural resources, identify oil, gas deposits, etc., and tracking, uh, sorry, tracking uh, uh, fishing grounds, etc. It includes uh, maritime intelligence. Uh, it is the integration of all uh, available information in order to identify, locate, and track potential threats in the maritime domain. Uh, then comes uh, maritime situational awareness, means the persistent monitoring of the uh, maritime domain. And next comes underwater, uh, underwater domain awareness uh, or knowledge of underwater uh, environment and the seabed uh, like uh, depth of the ocean, uh, resource deposits and the movement of submarine underwater. So these uh, are the uh, things comes under uh, maritime domain awareness. In fact, all the information regarding maritime domain will fall under maritime domain awareness. And it is also considered, uh, considered as the key to maritime security. So now uh, let me explain how China is enhancing. What are the Chinese strategies uh, for uh, gathering information, enhancing MDA? So uh, Chinese MDA efforts can be uh, classified into two areas, like uh, first in near seas or South China Sea, uh, then comes in the distant sea or, or far sea. So in the near sea, uh, China is uh, trying to develop various kinds kind of MDA assets, maritime domain uh, awareness assets, like uh, high frequency direction finding uh, sites or HFDF sites, which also uh, which allows to estimate the position of ships uh, by collecting electronic emissions and assessing the line of bearing to it. But the accuracy can be achieved only by the line of bearing from at least two suitably spaced HFDF or high frequency direction finding centers. And the more HFDF sites there are and uh, the closer they are to the intended target, the better their estimation would be. So this is uh, one of the reasons, this could be one of the reasons uh, by, uh, why China is constructing, constructing artificial islands. And uh, then comes uh, land-based radars, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, sea-based radars, which uh, permits to have coverage of areas where coastal radars are unable to reach. Uh, then comes air-based surveillance using manned and unmanned aircraft will also allow tracking from the air. Uh, then space-based surveillance system where it, can, uh, it has satellite constellation with optical radar and electronic capabilities, uh, which allow detecting, identifying, and tracking ships at seas with an accurate, accurate picture. And on top of that, China is maintaining frequent patrolling uh, in South China Sea, and also uh, constantly reforming its maritime law enforcement agencies and developing and upgrading its uh, naval capacities. But, but when it comes to distant sea, uh, the Chinese strategy is uh, uh, very different, like uh, uh, Chinese involvement uh, in the uh, mitigation or in the in the matter of protection of open seas uh, from piracy and terrorism allowed the movement of uh, Chinese uh, Navy, uh, PLA Navy, uh, legally in the distant sea. China is uh, also a member of uh, contact group on uh, piracy off the coast of Somalia. Uh, and it, it allowed uh, them to interact with other international uh, or other uh, navies and uh, uh, to have information and to uh, to attain various strategies, uh, better, uh, better strategies from them. So uh, according to Michael McDavid, in his uh, report called Becoming a, a Great Maritime Power, a Chinese Dream, uh, regarded uh, this uh, Chinese presence, uh, Chinese uh, uh, involvement in mitigation of uh, uh, piracy and terrorism uh, as a maritime laboratory. Because uh, it, uh, it allows them to gain information from others. And also, uh, they uh, have uh, they are gaining information for various technologies which they can include in their own uh, shipbuilding. So next could be the Chinese facilities abroad, like uh, China has its naval base in Djibouti and his uh, its facilities in Hambantota, uh, then Gwadar and in Pires in Greece. Uh, these uh, facilities uh, are allowing like uh, allowing them uh, to. Uh, uh, providing them logistical supports 
uh, whenever uh, they are having uh, they are operating uh, the navy is operating in the distant sea if they can provide such kind of facilities why can't they provide maritime intelligence so uh, then comes uh, uh, the chinese distant ocean survey means uh, china is extensively investing in the scientific uh, oceanographic research and china is having uh, the largest uh, research fleet uh, in the world so uh, this allowing them uh, to you know collaborate with international uh, organization like international seabed authority for uh, you know researching uh, in uh, on uh, various kind of minerals in distant uh, seas which allows them to have uh, legal movements in the distant sea and also china is uh, uh, you know maintaining uh, china is running dark like or without broadcasting in the distant sea uh, like there are reports that saying uh, that Ch china's uh, this distant sea uh, distant survey uh, vessels were found uh, in caroline island and indonesian region so these are the various strategies how china is developing uh, you know the, uh, enhancing their uh, in, uh, comp uh, gaining their information maritime intelligence so now what all are the advantages that china is going to gain so first of all it could gain information about deposits of uh, marine natural resources and make strategies to access it next it could also achieve information for its military development information for uh, naval uh, planners such as uh, like uh, such as uh, bathymetry bathymetry means uh, the de depth of the ocean then comes the currents and other underwater uh, like sea ajmal ajmal you have only 1 minute Yes, sir. Ajmal, you have uh, yeah, yeah, I'll conclude uh, quickly. So, and also the uh, under underwater environment, so that uh, which or oh, oh, which are all relevant to submarine warfare, where China can have a smooth movement of its peaceful movement of its submarines uh, without any you know uh, without any uh, barrier, without any uh, difficulty. So. Uh, it and also it would help them to uh, uh, develop various technologies uh, to you know uh, to uh, which would be adaptable for various kind of environment like in uh, in arctic region uh, it is uh, totally ice so the technology which we use in normal water will not be suitable for ice so they will have to you know uh, develop various technologies and the uh, water environment is different uh, everywhere so they it will allow them to have various technologies and also it will also allow them to spy on other nations next it, it would also help them to uh, uh, you know uh, protect its maritime rights and interests and assert its sovereignty especially in the south china sea so uh, by developing its uh, assets in maritime domain awareness uh, and also uh, see china is trying to uh, integrate taiwan so it is uh, constantly threatening taiwan that uh, it will uh, uh, you know uh, attack taiwan so if you, uh, any other nation please ajmal yes, please conclude please conclude i'm concluding it's done so if us want to support them with any technology or with assets uh, military assets uh, they can uh, china can track soon uh, before and uh, uh, respond to them uh, easily with their uh, 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 with their uh, equipment so uh, ultimately china could dominate the maritime domain uh, maritime domain so i would like to conclude by saying that even though china has not explicitly announced uh, that it believes that uh, maritime domain uh, awareness is a key to become a maritime power so thank you uh, thank you uh, everyone okay and now i uh, i i invite uh, mr kailas nath ji is from central university kerala is uh, chinese debt trap uh, thank you sir. Uh, thank you uh, chair uh, and also i thank all the organizers for this opportunity uh, good morning to all of you and my topic is a chinese debt trap aid to leverage uh, when talking about a chinese debt trap we cannot start uh, say, uh, start this uh, topic without uh, speaking about the bri Um, almost all of us know that BRI uh, overland and maritime corridor introduced by Xi Jinping in 2013 connects the uh, Chinese economy with the Euro, uh, Euro Eurasian uh, economy. Basically, it intends to uh, promote cultural, trade, and technological exchanges. Though, uh, and with with a major goal of policy coordination, facility uh, connectivity, and trade with financial integration. 
the as part of dri uh, the policy was infrastructure in, investment was uh, introduced by china though it was not uh, introduced in 2013 as a, as a main goal it was uh, part of their policy from the uh, from historical time itself as for the in, infrastructure investment policy of uh, china uh, you know, xi jinping signed a uh, 8 trillion dollar infrastructure investment plan spanning across asia europe and africa these infrastructure and connectivity uh, policies they needed for the implementation of the perfect implementation of dri uh, thus this implementation would reduce the transportation and logistic costs which uh, would help the business groups of uh, china to, uh, to make more, more profit this also increased the international trade of china with dri participating countries as per the study by china they projected a gdp growth of 0.7 percentage for uh, southeast asia under dri so uh, talk, then comes the debt trap diplomacy what is debt trap diplomacy this uh, is just a, it's just a policy that encompasses bur burdening a borrowing bur country nation with excessive credits with the intention of extracting social economic or political concessions from a debtor country this china's dri resulted in several such sustainable uh, sustainable debts uh, to various countries uh, through infrastructure deals which helped china in in uh, furthering their geo strategic interest also and also attaining uh, uh, assets that are geo strategically important for china's growth as a global power uh, for example uh, sri lanka's hampan tota port Kenya's Mombasa port and uh, Pakistan's uh, Gwadar port are complete examples of this uh, debt trap diplomacy. So, uh, when considering uh, debt trap uh, diplomacy, the perfect examples of debt trap diplomacy was seen in Africa, where uh, China uh, accounts for the 14 percentage of Africa's total debt stock. That is more than 14 percentage of Africa's debt is owned to uh, China. reason the main reason for uh, chinese uh, influence on africa was due to uh, the africans previous history with the western country where they preferred not to have an uh, tie with western countries due to their colonialist uh, uh, tendencies but considering the present situation this debt trap is leading to a new colonial uh, colonial system where uh, africa is being again owned by uh, china uh china preferred africa more than any other country because of their natural resources uh they try to um, you know, bring about infrastructure investment so that they can easily uh, use the natural resources of china using these uh, natural resources and making a uh, commodities to be sold in african ma market itself uh this uh, this debt trap led to the uh, low, uh, low, uh, uh, an example this debt trap lost uh, kenya's profitable mombasa port to china and also indoor uh, inland con container depot of nairobi was also uh, on the verge of being taken over by china as part of this debt trap uh, also uh, 88% of djibouti's gdp is owned to china as part of their infrastructure development programs which uh, is for in form of uh, loans etc uh, the main uh, uh, statement that china says that uh, about uh, bri is that it is not uh, not a strategic or something like that but it is basically an economic venture with no other hidden goals uh, involved in it <clears throat> and the primary goal of uh bri is not to uh, kind of put countries in a debt trap but uh, invest uh, strategically while engaging ec uh, economically and for the mutual benefit of all the countries involved but according to the uh, study of center of Develop uh, global development 23 countries involved in bri funded projects are at risk of debt of which 88 8, uh, 8 of them are highly vulnerable vulnerable uh, the main pro um, problem with the debt trap or Uh, this uh, investment uh, infrastructure investment was that they influenced the sovereignty of the country uh, the the, the debtor con country which helps in leveraging their infrastructure financing 
into uh, uh, geopolitical purchases and other forms of uh, geopolitics. Uh, also, China controls almost one tenth of all European port capacities across Mediterranean, Spain, Italy, and Greece. Uh, with uh, the recent example of Seabrugge Terminal in Berge, uh, Belgium, which was taken over by China as part of in uh, um, now defaulting the loans given under infrastructure investment. Redrawing the uh, map of global trade and uh, geopolitics is another impact of this infrastructure investment. Also, arm, to, arm to, this can be considered as arm twisting, which uh, in uh, normal terms is a criminal offense in uh, India and other countries, etc. Although uh, China has waived off uh, debt uh, with, uh, with some countries in uh, Africa, but it cannot be said, uh, it cannot be same for everyone and uh, other parts of the world. Exam, uh, ex especially for South Asia. When considering South Asia becoming Indian Ocean and Indo Pacific as a new theater of geopolitical uh, uh, importance, Beijing is trying to entrench its presence in and leverage the Indian Ocean and Indo Pacific region by uh, uh, focusing on vulnerable countries in the region. The main problem with that is that uh, they include dubious clauses in their. Uh, um, uh, uh, and prospector investment pro uh, plans, uh, including bilateral agreements, which in the far, in the future will lead to uh, forming an ally or um, uh, um, arm twisting, uh, leading to an arm twisting situation. <clears throat> this uh, debt trap is also used as a systematic method of acquiring real estate of strategic uh, importance. Uh, for example. Uh, 1,500 acres, uh, 15,000 acres of land surrounding the Humbertota port was acquired by uh, China as part of this uh, policy. Although China claims that it was only an economic uh, aspect, but the uh, Sri Lankan authorities have confirmed that they have also included uh, intelligence and strategic open opportunities uh, surrounding the uh, uh, ports of Humbertota and uh, other areas. Uh, Chinese engagement with Maldives is also a similar situation with uh, 1.4 billion dollars uh, uh, as uh, external debt owed to China. This uh, debt trap is also can be considered as a neo-colonial uh, system of uh, system goals with Asia uh, uh, counteracting Bretton Woods uh, regime, which was established after the Second World War. And the financing agencies of China, uh, China like. Uh, China Development Bank, China Exim Bank, Agricultural Development Bank of China, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, Bank of China, etc., are uh, acting as, as equivalent to the Bretton Woods system. <clears throat> Furthermore, China is also looking for the direct entry uh, into uh, Europe through uh, countries like uh, Mongolia, Montenegro, etc. Uh, it can also uh, start discussing Chinese uh, debt trap as a Kailash, please conclude. Kailas, please conclude. Okay. Uh, discussing the uh, debt trap of China's uh, this is, uh, discussing debt trap as the, uh, China's grand strategy for world domination is not something to be uh, reckoned with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kailash. So. All six presentations are over now.